and thousands of uh, meters beneath the Pacific Ocean lies vast deposits of the metals which are needed for the shift to renewable energy. Mining companies are ready to scoop up this sunken treasure strewn across an area more than half the size of the continental United States. But not much is known about the ecosystem deep beneath the ocean and what impacts mining these rocks might have. Viewers Steve Bargona has more. Take a look. These black rocks are loaded with some of the most important minerals in the world today, including cobalt, manganese, and nickel. Canada-based The Metals Company gathered them from off the deep seabed some 5,000 meters down. The company has access to about 1.6 billion tons of them, according to CEO Gerard Barron. That's enough to be able to build 280 million mid-sized electric vehicle batteries, so enough to electrify the entire USA passenger fleet. As the world transitions away from fossil fuels, the demand for metals is increasing. Meeting global climate goals will require roughly 20 times more nickel and cobalt by 2040 than are used now. The focus has to be on where can we get a supply of these metals that is secure, but also with the lightest planetary and human impact. Estimates say there's more of these metals on the seabed than in all of the reserves on land. And Barron says they come without the human exploitation that plagues cobalt mining in the top producer, the Democratic Republic of Congo, or the rainforest raising seen in the leading nickel supplier, Indonesia. But there will be environmental consequences. The deep sea floor is one of the world's most extreme environments but it's not lifeless. Extremely cold, extremely dark, very high pressure, obviously, at, down at 5,000 meters, uh, and very, very low food availability. And remarkably, uh, yeah, life finds a way. Adrian Glover leads a team at London's Natural History Museum studying life in the abyss. While the oddballs are obvious, he says most of the living things are easy to overlook. You land on the seabed, and, and to be brutally honest, it doesn't look like there's much life there. You see the nodules, you see mud, it's only when you sieve those muds on a fine sieve and pick the nodules up and look at them down a microscope on the surface, you discover there's quite a lot of biodiversity in it. Glover's team recently identified more than 5,000 never-before-seen species. How they all fit into the ocean ecosystem is a big unknown. Also unknown is how the noise, light, and plumes of mud from mining operations would affect ocean life. The International Seabed Authority is working on regulations for this new industry. Glover and others are advising it, including on where to put refuges. Similar to, you know, fisheries is where you try and figure out which areas you, you protect and which areas you allow. Meanwhile, environmental groups are calling for a moratorium, along with more than 20 national governments and more than 30 major companies. But the metals company says it plans to submit a mining application late next year, bringing the controversy over deep sea mining back to the surface. Steve Barragona, VOA News. And viewers, Jessica Stone sat down with NII Simmons of the Atlantic Council to explore how trade in critical minerals uh, is creating new opportunities in emerging and frontier markets. Take a look. We just got back from the APEC summit and a lot of companies that we met there are pursuing a China plus one strategy. How does that apply in this field of critical minerals? A lot of consumer electronics depend on the device have multiple chips and these are the same chips that are used in um, other um, industries um, i.e industrials uh, um, defense and automobile manufacturers that found the car there could be up to 10 chips in in a in a electric vehicle and then um underpinning all this is uh chips a lot of most chips have critical rare earth minerals that come from brazil africa India, China. There are new opportunities as a result of this search for critical minerals, right? Sure, sure. Um, I mean, there's, there's, depend on, on the material, but uh, Latin America, um, countries like, you know, Peru, um, you know, Bolivia, Brazil, uh, Africa, you have uh, the, mostly the Southern African countries, DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, Zimbabwe, uh, and then you have Australia. But I would say more importance is being put in Africa because of 
you know, geopolitical reasons. Uh, there are a lot of Western um, policymakers are concerned about China's foray into Africa through the Belt Road Initiative and also uh, Russia with the Wagner Group. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there are certain countries that, you know, without their critical career of minerals, you know, certain supply chains and um, consumer products or vehicle manufacturing will run to a halt, i.e. Tesla. Um, huh. Tesla gets probably a good half of its lithium reserves from the continent of Africa. Hmm. And China currently still dominates the processing space. So what are we seeing in terms of additional countries trying to give more opportunities to Western countries to diversify in that sense? In other words, replace some of China's processing power. We have an ally, Australia. They can they can ramp up processing. They're part of the Quad. Um, they're they're also part of the uh, AUKUS um, military mm-hmm. submarine deal. Um, they will probably ramp that up. Uh, they have no choice uh, um, to to you know they, they probably have to ramp it up by a factor of four or five fold to produce certain um, defense um, capability for uh, for its own submarine fleet and a future submarine in our and a Western alliance submarine fleet, i.e., U.S. and and England. Uh, in the UK, uh, other countries could do it. I could possibly see a country like India do it. Um, mm-hmm. India, in, India has, India has, because you know they have the industrial um, progress. You have, you know, Marinda Marinda, which is a uh, Indian. Uh, they're they're akin to the, a John Deere or a Caterpillar. They do a lot of farm equipment. You have, uh, um, you know, other companies. Um, you know, but I think the, the, India has legacy companies and its supply chain that can uh, potentially um, process certain uh, critical rare earth minerals. There are a lot of incentives on the table. The United States has the Inflation Reduction Act, which has a lot of incentives for green energy investment. It has the CHIPS Act, which has a lot of investments even overseas for U.S. companies to invest overseas to create supply chain resilience in the semiconductor field. Europe has its own uh, sense of incentives. How are all of these Western incentives affecting the critical minerals market for extraction and production? The EU has its own version of of the EU CHIPS Act, which mirrors pretty much to the T uh, the U.S. Chips Act, and those three acts in itself have an opportunity to uh, support democratic uh, partners in other in other um, you know emerging frontier markets. All right, Nee Simmons, thanks so much for joining us from the Atlanta Council. We appreciate your time. Jessica, thank you for having me.